Hi, I'm Meredith Binder. I was just confused by... Hi, I'm Meredith Binder. I was just confused by Andrew. And I think his program is marvelous. It's really empowering. I took my first acting class when I was 40. Um, I just decided it was something I wanted to try. I wanted to do it. Um, I didn't get a lot of encouragement from either my family or um, the instructors at the acting studio that it was sort of like, it's great that you're trying. This is so great that you're doing something and you're not just an engineer and you, and, but nobody seemed to think, nobody seemed to really think that I could get bigger, go farther, come to New York, get work. And I have, I just had to raise my children first. So I think I'm, I think I'm a testimony to endurance. No, absolutely. Now the next question, I like, well, go back to what you said. If you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. That's the number one. <laughs> but the question I was going to ask you is what are the three greatest strengths you bring to being a professional actor? Um, I think my breadth of experience outside of the acting world, um, you know, as they say, there's nothing more boring than actors who only act. And um, I do really well with any kind of corporate role because it was an engineering manager. I raised two children. Um, I was also a school teacher before I went into engineering and I was a Peace Corps volunteer. So I've had a breadth of experiences that people who have just always known they wanted to be an actor and went into acting might have missed out on. Absolutely. Now the next one I want to ask is what, ex well, this one's actually perfect for you. You just mentioned you worked in the, um, almost said retail world, the business world actually. What experience do you have in leading others? What experience do you have to what? To what experience do you have in weeding others? Weighted outers? Weeding. What experience do you have in weeding others? Being I'm a weeder. Do you want to spell that? <laughs> L-E-A-D-I-N-G. Leading others. Got it. Okay, sorry. Um, so leading others. Well, I was an engineering manager. So... I had a team of, I think at the height of my career, I had 50 direct reports and some of them had reports as well. So that was important uh, experience. Um, it's just how do you take care of these people so that they can do their best work and will be encouraged to stay with the company because it costs a lot of money to replace people and takes a lot of time. And how can you still meet the company's goals, even when some of your team feels it's the wrong direction the company's going in, or they're having personal issues and they're not happy in their job anymore. So how do you get through it while taking care of everybody? No, I agree. You know, a lot of people are not easy to work with. <laughs> and hey, you can use me for an example, you know, I worked with a lot of people who I really liked, there's other ones that he does want to throw me underneath the bus. Mm -hmm. But if you have chemistry with good people, it makes the job fun and a lot easier to do. It does, yes. So the next one, I'm going to ask you a two-part now. First one is, 
did you ever attend any acting classes, number one? And number two, what age groups do you have the most experience in working with? Well, I, I started with acting classes. I didn't have any experience with acting before I was 40. And I went to a studio school and then I've just gone on to other schools. At one point I was in an MFA program. So I really studied a lot because, um, partly because I'm good at school and partly because it's, it's the easiest way to get in. It, you know, you, you feel really confident when you know what you're doing and you can go out and impress people, but to just kind of throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks, that would be hard for me. I'm more of a planner than that. Um, it works for some people, but not me. And then for age groups, um, was, you know, I was a teacher and I have been teaching acting classes over the years, sometimes children, small children, high school children, and then adults. And I think I really, I don't think it matters what age people are. It's the person. I mean, I believe the personality is largely inherited and the, the people who I liked as children, I still like them as young adults now. And it's just, um, yeah, I have friends of all ages. It, there really isn't, really isn't a cutoff in either direction. No, it's all about the strength of, of the person and the strength of your character. That's all that really matters. But speaking of strength, how would you define yourself? Are you like strong physically and mentally? Like, do you stay in shape? No. <laughs> <laughs> Exercise bores me. I like to walk a lot, hike, do yoga, cross country ski, but I don't really do enough of any of it to stay in tip top shape. I, I'm fortunate I don't tend to gain weight. So I think it kind of slips to a lower priority because I'm not reminded of it. So if someone said hypothetically, would you be interested in doing like a human pyramid? Are you the type of person that will jump at it or, or say not interested? Well, it depends. I mean, um, kind of gymnastic yoga type stuff is kind of in my wheelhouse. So I'd probably say, okay, and what will I do? Like if I can be on top, that's a pretty good deal because I can climb up there and I'm limber and everything. And if I fall, I'm limber. I don't get hurt as easily. But if I have to hold people up, that's probably not going to work because I don't have the strength. I love that stuff. I'm a loser. <laughs> Pardon me? Oh, I love that stuff. I'm a loser. You're a loser? <laughs> I don't think so. Well, I do do a lot of video challenges if you're interested in being part of them. Sure. And we can talk about that off the air. But do you, you make the human pyramids, huh? That's <laughs> well, I have the human pyramid challenge. I have the Dumbo challenge. Jumbo buck. It's a lot of fun. It sounds like fun. Yeah. <laughs> so the next question I want to ask you is what is the most difficult part of being an actor for you? Um, I think the constant, I think it's hard for all of us, but the constant rejection, I've gotten a lot better with it over the years, but I used to feel like, well, I did a good job for these people last time. Why don't they want me back? Or, um, you know, I, I don't understand, I'm doing these great auditions and I, I'm not getting cast over and over and over again. Why do people keep having me back if they're just not gonna cast me? You know, and now I understand so much more about the industry that there's so many things at play. Once I was cast in a lead role in an independent film in the Northwest, and then all of a sudden they stopped communicating with me, which was wrong. They should have told me what was up, but they stopped communicating with me and then uh, later when the film came out, it became clear to me that one of the investors had said she would like to invest and by the way, she was interested in this role, or maybe they felt obligated to offer her a role. And um, she's an excellent actress. You know, the film did not suffer for the decision they made. If I were in their situation, I probably would have made the same decision. You need money to make your film. I just would have um, told me, so I wasn't waiting for my shoot date. I said, we're very sorry we had to recast the role. Would you accept a smaller role? Or we hope you'll come audition for us in the future. But I would have tried to leave it in, a, in good standing. Well, I agree. You know, 
I should have a hashtag, you know, for a dollar every time I say I agree. No, but I do uh, understand where you're coming from. There's times where I go for job interviews and they interview me like, you know, two, three times and they're like, well, didn't we just interview you? It's like, yeah, you said this is a two-part interview. And I get excited. It's like, okay, come in, do the interview. If you get a phone call, you know, that's the second part. Get a phone call. Is this the second part? No, uh, this is somebody else who wants to interview you. Fine. So you get interviewed a second time. Get a phone call. Is this the second part? No, we want to interview you for a third time. It's like, God damn it. <laughs> it's like, how many times I, are you get? Oh, go ahead. I was just saying, are these different positions in the same company? Because I've had that happen before. I'm like, oh, wait, I thought I was interviewing for that job. It's a different job? No, but okay. it, it was the same exact job. I was looking for a cashier position. First assistant manager, then the manager, then the hiring manager. It's like, well, okay, I were you I got make me do the second position or stop wasting my time. <laughs> but there are yeah. some jobs where you know, I'm just being completely honest, you know, it's, I can get a job like that. I can get a job easily. That's not the problem. You know, my family likes to tell, remind me how many times I got fired or how many jobs I had. I only got, I only got fired one time and, and how many times I quit a job. It's over 13 because the jobs don't work out. But someone tells me, someone tells you, Here's the script. This is what you're going to do. And he's like, okay. You know, you pretty much you, you shut up and you, you do what you're supposed to do. For me, I'm like, okay, but I think it should be done differently. I think it should be done this way because I look at things differently and I break them down and I make it easier to myself. Okay, I can do it if it's done in a different way. And people are like, well, it can't be like that. But, you know, it's, hey, monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> this is about you, not me. But it, I like, I'm like you know, a professional wrestler. I'm like the wrestler CM Punk. I walk and talk to my own beat. I walk to the beat in my own drum. I make it easier for myself to understand what I have to do. If you're like, here's the paperwork, don't bother me. It's going to go right over my head. But if you take the time to break it down and understand and help me understand it, then I can learn that way. It's not like, here it is, don't bother me. I don't, I just don't learn like that. Yeah. Yeah. And some, it's interesting. Some people are visual learners. Some people are auditory learners. Some people are experiential learners. It's just, you have to, I know from being a teacher, you have to reach them all. Actually, this one's a pretty interesting question because, yeah, as you mentioned, you are a teaser. What do, let's see, how long I say this? What do you think you will dislike about your next job? Well, um, if I have to go back to engineering, I will miss not having enough time for acting. And if it's an acting job that I don't like, it would probably be if it were if there was some dissent from above like the producers weren't agreeing on something sometimes that can trickle down into a lot of mixed messages and people are unhappy on set and i'm just an actor so i'm a cog in the system so like i'm perfectly happy to do whatever you tell me to do but if then the production designer and the other keys are unhappy you notice so that would be the other thing um being an actor is kind of cool because it's kind of happy-go-lucky because you're only responsible for your own performance, really, and just being a good overall person to work with. And I can do that. <laughs> oh, that's right. And, you know, even in the world of professional wrestling, as he just mentioned, you are a spoke on a wheel. You know, you are a dime of a... What's the expression? You are a dime of a dozen. We can get any higher anyone and anyone... So it doesn't matter what expression you use. Time of a dozen, spoke on a wheel. The point is, you're easily replaceable. Now, that's a two-sided thing because, yes, you are easily replaced, but will that person you replace you with, say you replace me with you, and that you're a great actor, 
but can you do what I do? Like, what makes you different? If you replace me with you, can he do what he does? He does? And you see, and also you have talked about the fan base because the fan base always comes back to see this person and to can this person you want to start from scratch and really invest into this person. You know, you look at wrestling, you know, you look at John Cena, you look at Hulk Hogan, you look at Arnold Schwarzenegger, Fester Stallone. These people are a household name. So when they, even if they do a crappy movie, I'm a big fan of Hugh Jackman. Even if he does a horrible movie, I go see it because I like Hugh Jackman. And it's mm-hmm. funny because I imagine him as a Wolverine in all his films. <laughs> so it's like a Wolverine being like a house person or being a house sitter, but he's not being Wolverine, but because you're a fan, you can see that. That's why you go see it. But yes, people are replaceable. But it doesn't mean you're going to get the same exact results yeah. as you did the first time. So the other question I want to ask you, I want to hear how you feel about that. About what? About being replaceable? Yes. Oh, I'm used to it. I was in a position in one of the engineering companies I worked with and you know, I was the head of this whole department and everything. And I decided I wanted to leave and move to another industry because it was a time in my career where if I didn't leave, I wouldn't have the chance. And it was, the company had gone under acquisition and it was, things weren't going to settle down for realistically at least 18 months. And we weren't accomplishing anything. So I thought, well, if I'm going to go, the market's hot right now, I should go. And so I left and everyone's like, what are we going to do without you? They offered me more money. They, uh, they made me stay to like the two weeks, even though we weren't doing anything. Um, they really didn't want to lose me. And they, they hired somebody who took over part of my job. And then two other people who were already there took over some other parts of the job. And it was seamless. You know, there wasn't one person who could do everything right away coming in the gate but um, they, they spread out the responsibility. It went smoothly. And um, then one of, um, one of my employees eventually took over as he grew, took over everything I used to do. And now he has what would have been our boss's job because he stayed with the company the whole time. And, um, you know, I'm, he's highly regarded and all the rest of it. So he sort of took up my destiny. <laughs> So the last two questions I want to ask you on the script part anyway, is as an acting, well, see, as an actor, what values do you have and what is the most rewarding part of being an actor? Um, For me, acting is about telling stories, not really performing. I perform to tell the story. So I feel ethically bound to tell the story as best I can. And there was a time I was working on, you know, the 48 48-hour National Film Challenge? Heard yeah, of so it. I was working on uh, someone else's. I wasn't producing my own that year. I was on a team and I was an actor. And the director came to me and she said, this is too long. Can you cut some of it? And I looked at it and then I started cutting some parts out and I was cutting scenes I was in. And she told me later, you know, long after the project, she said, that's when I really had a lot of respect for you, that you were willing to take out your own scenes to help us get under time. And I said, well, I was taking out what we didn't need and we could still tell the story because we have to get this shot and in the canon in the festival or where there was no point to this weekend and we've used a lot of resources for this weekend, people, time, favors, relatives, (laughs) you name it, money. Um, So, I think that's what I feel duty bound is, is really to tell the story as best I can. Absolutely. Now it's all about telling a story, doing a talk show, being a pro. I'm a big wrestling fan, obviously, you know, being a talk show host, being a wrestling fan, being a writer. If you are a great storyteller, then you can tell any story out there. But the next one I want to ask you is, you know, I want you to be brutally honest. When I first messaged you to be a guest on my talk show, what was your first honest opinion reading it? 
What made you say yes? How do you feel now? And what do you recommend it to other people? Well, I'm particularly interested in, um, in people who have overcome challenges to be their best self, partly because of some of my relatives and what they've had to go through, just having some learning differences and so on. And um, partly because I was a CASA volunteer, a court appointed special advocate for kids in foster care. And um, those kids, they, some of them are born addicted to drugs. Some of them are, they just haven't gotten the attention they needed or, or they've moved school so many times they, they're still not reading at age eight or nine or uh, it's, it's scary some of the things these kids have been through. And so anything word we can get out to say, you're worth it, you're worth the time, you're worth the energy, invest in yourself. You, you're worthy of every opportunity that comes your way and you can do this. And if you need help, ask. If you need something needs to be done, get that done so you can proceed. And it's interesting because for actors, they say, you know, so if you have crooked teeth, get them fixed. <laughs> and it's just kind of, okay. So then you might say, well, I'm an actor. I don't have the money to get it fixed. Well, get a job where you can earn the money so you can get your teeth fixed. You know, it's, um, well, then you need a new headshot. Then you need, uh, just get it done. You know, no one wants to hear everything you have to go through to get this done. They just want it done. And um, I think you're a testimony to that. And I find that inspiring. And I'm happy to be a part of anything that will help people. I appreciate that. Now, the last question I want to add to is how can our fans and listeners follow you on social media? Are you on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn? Oh, yes. And YouTube. And I have a website, MeredithBinder.com. Um, it's being updated right now. And um, I think those are the main ways, yeah. No, absolutely. And then the last one I want you to see, um, I asked you how I usually end the show, but we have five minutes left. Now, besides me, and I appreciate that, have you ever worked with people with disabilities? And for people who want to follow into your footsteps, what would be your words of wisdom? Well, in terms of working with people with disabilities, yes. You know, as a teacher, both an acting teacher, working in independent studios, but also um, when I was teaching at a Catholic school, um, you know, all the kids are together. They weren't sorted out by abilities. There were no advanced classes. Uh, if, and this was a poor area. Some of the kids needed glasses and so on. They couldn't see well enough. I was doing a seating chart based on their eyes while talking to their parents about getting them glasses and so on. So, um, you know, very much understand people working at different levels and still needing to reach the same goal. No, the other question was advice. Yeah. Um, I think I, my first thing is that you will have to work hard, no matter how talented you are, no matter how good your training is, you're gonna have to work hard. And if you're going to go into this business and there's no guarantees. So if there's anything else you can do and be happy, go do that instead. And that's, that's a well-known saying in our field. Um, the other thing I would say, and I get in this trouble for this a lot because I like to help people, but don't give people advice because in our field, people pay other people lots of money to get advice. And if you just give advice, no matter how heartfelt or how right you are, you're putting yourself out there to be criticized for the advice that you give. And don't put yourself in that situation. It's even though you wanna help people and you think you know the answer and what harm does it do to at least listen to the advice and think about it, um, just don't do that. I've had that backfire on me so many times. That's true. I know people where they would ask for advice and then they listen and it doesn't go their way. Then they blame you. And then it's like, you know, you ask, you answer, you know, take, it's not the end of the world. I think the problem is that it's misconstrued a lot because there's um, so many people in this industry and some people are so desperate that sometimes I think they're looking for a scapegoat or something. But I told one actress on set, uh, her background was primarily in 
theater, but she was friends with the director. So she got hired on to this independent film and she was doing great. And I loved working with her. And she said to me, well, you've got a really big film resume. You know, how did you do that? And how did you learn how to do film work? And I said, well, I took classes. And she said, oh, um, well, how did you meet like your agent, your casting directors? And I said, well, you might want to take classes from them because then you meet them. And it feels a little bit it's like you're paying to meet them and yeah. they just want to meet you. But it's a really efficient way to meet people. And somehow that got turned around to, I told her she needed to take acting lessons. Period, as so though I thought she was a bad actor. And she complained to the director about that. That I had told her she needed to take acting classes. I didn't. I, I told her if she wanted to meet casting directors and talent agents, it was an efficient way to do it. And she might want to consider it. That's very different. Yeah. I was helping her and it was turned around to a criticism that I gave. So. I still have a hard time because when people ask me, I want to help them, I want to help them so much. And um, it's bad to put yourself in that situation. I'm still learning that. I agree. Now, I do have a couple questions for you off the air about wrapping up your interview segment. That was an honor and privilege to have me as a guest. I'm looking forward to part two down the road. Until we meet again, catch you later.